Hello, this is R4G4, your host today for this presentation on artificial intelligence turned sideways. That was the best humor you're going to see today during this very long, slow, and deliberate presentation. The orange barbell behind me is mine. I lift it all the time. Today's presentation will qualify for one metric hour if you are a certified public accountant or an enrolled agent. If you are a lawyer, then you have our condolences. <laughs> if you're a Florida lawyer, then you will get one hour of credit whether you deserve it or not. The presenter is still getting ready and he'll probably never be ready, but here he is. Bye-bye. Hello there. Welcome to this presentation entitled Using Grantor Retained Annuity Trusts. I am Alan Gassman. I'm a tax lawyer in Clearwater, Florida. And for the past few months, I've been working very hard on Estate View software, which I'll be using today to help you understand and enjoy grantor retained annuity trusts. So the enclosures today will include the PowerPoint, some form grantor, retrust, grantor retained annuity trust language, and some other goodies that come from the Estate View platform. As the Dummy said, I'm not a dummy. Yes, you are a dummy. And as you said, this presentation will qualify for CPA and enrolled agent credit if you came through CPA Academy. If you came through our website, then you can get up to one hour credit if you are a Florida lawyer. So if you have any questions, you can go to the questions box and click on the upside down pyramid, type in your question, and we will try to answer it if we know the answer. This presentation will be posted to our YouTube channel later on today, where you and everyone you know can watch it as many times as you want to, or as many times as you don't want to. Next week, we're gonna talk about using LLCs and limited partnerships in trust and estate planning and business planning. The week after that, we're going to be talking about using installment sales in estate planning. And the week after that, we're going to talk to the founders of Florida's first female-only owned trust company, Gentry Burns and KB Primble, about trusteeship, trusteeship challenges, etc. If you would like free use of our estate view while we continue to make it less imperfect, you can go to estateview.link, tell it your email is test at test.com, tell it your password is test, don't tell anyone else those special words, and then you can use estateview for at least a while. Okay, I'm gonna start off with the first polling question. What is a GRAT? Well, A, a GRAT, is the acronym for a grantor retained annuity trust where you guessed it the grantor retains the right to receive an annuity and then after the grantor gets the annuity payments the rest of the trust passes estate tax free b it's a structure used to avoid estate tax c it's a very good way to move assets out of a person's estate without risking gift tax exposure. And D, it is not ideal for generation skipping exemption planning. And the correct answer is A, B, C, D, or E. All of those being grades that I got in various subjects in high school. All right, so. A little bit more about GRATs. They were created by statute in Internal Revenue Code Section 2702. They are not a smoke and mirrors technique. They're an actual congressionally permitted technique. 
And the concept is that if I put a million dollars worth of assets in the GRAT and it pays me $100,000 a year for 10 years, then the value of my gift is fairly small because I put a million in and the present value of my right to receive 100,000 a year for 10 years might be 920,000. So I've only made an $80,000 gift. I've only used 80,000 of my estate and gift tax exclusion, but whatever's in that trust after the 10th year escapes estate tax, even though it may be a heck of a lot more than 80,000. Now, the discount rate that we use here is called the section 7520 rate. It's named after Internal Revenue Code section 7520, which is a very exciting code section. And this darn rate is edging up, as you can see. In January, it was 4.6, went up to five in April. Now in August, it's back up to five. It's calculated every year based upon approximately 120% of the applicable federal midterm rate, which is, I think, basically what they sell five-year treasury bills for. So why would you use a GRAT? Well, here's an example. In this Castina case, somebody transferred a 41% interest in a partnership, took a 35% discount, and said it was worth $12 million, and maybe used their $12 million estate tax exemption, hoping not to pay gift tax. Well, the IRS said, sorry, it's worth $35 million, and you only get a 25% discount. The tax court determined it was worth $24 million. Well, as a result of this, the taxpayer probably paid some real gift tax. If they had put this into a GRAT and taken back payments over time, then instead of a gift being imputed, when the value doubled, the client would only have gotten payments of twice as much for the term of years. So there would have been no gift exposure. So there's less reason for the IRS to come and look at it. Another reason for the GRAT is that under the Florida law and Texas law, if you have the right to receive annuity payments, creditors generally can't touch them. So today I have a million dollars, tomorrow I'm getting a million a year in annuity payments. Today, a creditor with a judgment against me could take my million dollars. Tomorrow, a creditor who was not a creditor before I set up the GRAT would not be able to necessarily take those payments and the payments I receive can be creditor proof. And we have established these GRATs offshore in jurisdictions that have the same rules. And we've enabled the trustees to make the GRAT payment to other uh, trusts for the same grantor. So good luck getting hold of the grantor's payments when they're being made in the Isle of Man or the Cook Islands or Nevis. So let me at this point go ahead and open up the software. I'll find the uh, software here. Where is it? There it is. It's way back there on my fourth computer screen. Okay, so I went to uh, stateview.link. Stateview dot link and the software opens and then I go to the calculators here and I click on the calculators and I choose the GRAT calculator. So here is the mathematics of GRATs. Today is August 5th. Happy birthday to anyone who was born on August 5th. The 7520 rate this month is 5%. We're gonna say that this grantor is 60 years old and chooses a 10 year term, wants to get equal annual payments, so they're level, and assumes that the assets in the grant will grow at 7% a year and wants to pay no gift tax, wants to have no gift at the time the grant is funded. And let's say that the grant is gonna be funded with $10 million. So I'll move this to $10 million. 
try to move this to $10 million. Let me see. Ten. All right. So what the computer has done here is it shows me I have a 10-year term, level payments, the value of my assets going in, $10 million, 75-20 rate, 5%. Gift value, a little bit negative, which means zero. So the annuity payment that I'll receive for the next 10 years is $1,295,051.61 a year for 10 years. And what's going to be left in the trust after the 10th year, based on a 7% rate of return, is going to be $1,778,500, which will never be subject to federal estate tax. So let's talk about how that works. It starts here at 10 million on the Excel spreadsheet. It has 700,000 of growth. It makes a million 295 annuity payment and it's worth 9 million four at the end of year one. There's no estate tax savings if I die during the GRAT term, because if you die during the GRAT term, according to the IRS, and they're probably right, it's not just the value of the payments that you are owed, it's what the, is in the GRAT that's enabling it to make those payments because of Internal Revenue Code Section 2036. But I see here that a typical 60-year-old has a, light, a, ter, a uh, survival probability for 10 years of 87.92%. And I see that my estate tax savings will be 711,418. It's really a no-brainer. I used no gift tax exclusion and $711,000 passes estate tax free if I survive the 10th year. But let's look at a different alternative. So I click duplicate here. And now I'm looking at GRAT2, which you see the new level here of GRAT2 across the top of the screen. And let's say I'm a little bit of a daredevil and I will go to a 14 year term. I still have an 80% chance of, of living from age 60 to age 70. And that's pessimistic because the standard life expectancy tables are from 2010. They include smokers, they include people who are not wealthy and on average don't take as good care of themselves, don't get as good medical treatment. Well, now you see the estate tax savings is a million two. So I could show this to the client and ask the client which they want to use. And then I would like to show the client a third thing. So I click duplicate again. Now I'm on GRAT3. I stay with a 14-year term, but you don't have to pay equal annual payments with a GRAT. You could start low and go higher as long as it doesn't increase by more than 20% a year. So here, I'm going to change it from level to increasing 20% a year. I'm going to stay with a zero gift value. And what happened? Now, remember, under for a 10-year level term, I had a million eight escaping estate tax. For a 14-year level term, I have three million escaping estate tax. And for a 14-year term that's increasing by 20% a year, starting at 273,000 and going to 2,926, I am now showing after 10 years that I've pushed 4 million two out of the estate, estate tax savings, a million six. So those are three alternatives. But there's a better alternative, of course. And you're saying don't put $10 million in the GRAT. Put $10 million in an LLC or put $10,100,000 in an LLC and transfer a 99% non-voting member interest to the GRAT. So what will I do here? I will hit advanced and I will go to 
discount rate. I've got $10 million of discountable assets you see there. And I'm going to take a 5% discount. Now, you can't take a very high discount when you're depending upon the LLC to make distributions or you'll have to transfer LLC interests. But certainly a 5% discount would be defendable. And just that 5% discount brings the assets in the grad, the remainder from 3 million to 5 million. Is that possible? Let me go back to zero. No, it was, it was I'm sorry. Let me go to GRAT 4. GRAT 4 is the same as GRAT uh, 3, but now I'll do that discount of 5%. You see a big difference there. You see from 4 million 2 to 5 million 2 just on a 5% discount. How about a 10% discount? 6 million 3. How about a 15% discount? 7 million 4. So you see here, you start on uh, clat number four. There's really 10 million assets there, but the, the methodology is that the payments are based on 8 million 5. The payments are smaller than they were in GRAT 3 because of that discount. And at the end of the day, you have 7 million 437 in savings. So a 14 year GRAT with a 15% discount might be good, or even a 20% discount, which would get you to 8 million 5. All right. Now, the thing we're not considering or showing has been that the grantor is going to pay the income taxes on the income of the grant. So I'm going to show you grant number five. Grant number five is just like grant number four, except the I'm going to show you the result of the grantor paying the income taxes on the income of the grant. I click that to yes. And there's the savings from the burn. So the savings from the burn are significant, as you can see in this column. And the total estate tax savings goes from 3 million four to 3 million nine. So that gives you some of the basic mechanics of the GRAT. It also shows you a little bit about how to use a state view. Now, let's re explain this and see how this works for a client. So, I have, for example, GRAT 1, where the, or actually, let's compare GRAT 3. Let's look at GRAT 3 and GRAT 5. So, I'm going to go to Generate Explanation, and I'm going to ask for the PowerPoints. For GRAT 3 and GRAT 5, the client's name is Mary Jones Kaladi, and I'm going to hit Submit. Okay, so now I have two PowerPoint slides to share with the client. The first one is GRAT number 3. I open the PowerPoint slide. Move it to slideshow. And the grantor put $10 million into the GRAT, received back annual payments for 14 years beginning at $273,490. The total payments received back will be $16,189. This is the spreadsheet that shows the numbers. And at the end of the day, there will be $4,199,000 in the GRAT. Estate tax savings, $1,679,000. So that is the, uh, the first GRAT we just looked at. Now let me go back to the software. Uh-oh, what did I do with it? It's got to be around here somewhere. Okay. Now I will look at the GRAT number five, I'll click general explanation again, 
I just want to see grat number five PowerPoint. All right, there's grat number five PowerPoint. Now this is the one with the discounts. So, oops, sorry, I'm mixing things up. All right, so with this one, the grantor puts $10 million into an LLC and forms a grat. The grantor retains 1% voting in the LLC and transfers a 99% non-voting member interest to the grat. Now, the next time you see these, it's gonna make clear that first you fund the grat, and then we like to wait at least 30 days before we transfer the 99% LLC interest to the grat because of the step transaction doctrine. But if we took a 20% discount, we would consider the LLC to be worth about, the LLC interest to be worth about 8 million. So the payments start at 218,000 a year, they go up 20% a year for 14 years. So at the end of the day, we show the spreadsheet and we show the amount of tax savings from the assets left in the GRAT, and we show the estate tax savings from what Professor Hesch calls the burn, and that's the fact that the grantor is paying the income tax on the income of the GRAT, and then we show the total estate tax savings we show after the GRAT retained term. The next thing I want to mention, as long as it's here in this demonstrative PowerPoint, is that you don't want to die during the GRAT term. If you die during the GRAT term, then all of the assets in the GRAT come back in the grantor's estate. And that would be reason to do, that would be a reason to do short-term GRATs. But what are you going to do about this risk that the grantor dies and you have estate tax inclusion. Well, if you're married, you should be able to draft the GRAT to qualify for the marital deduction. Now, let's say that I'm putting uh, 10 million in the GRAT and I'm getting 100,000 a year for 10 years. And I'm in year eight, I have two payments left, year nine and 10. There's only 200,000 coming back to me and I die. Well, the IRS is gonna tax everything in the grat because it was the tree providing the fruit for those two last payments under code section 2036. So while I should have my payments go into my estate and then to my spouse or a marital deduction trust, that's not going to save the estate tax. So with some fancy drafting, it appears possible to have the GRAT itself become a qualified person, I mean, terminal interest property marital deduction trust. On my death before the end of the GRAT term, the GRAT will pay all of its income to my spouse from the date of my death, and they will file a marital deduction election on my form 706. And maybe it'll be a Clayton Q-tip provision where basically they can decide after my death, do you wanna get it qualified for the marital deduction where it's gonna to have to pay all income and it's gonna be subject to estate tax in my surviving spouse's estate? Or do you want for it to be considered to be part of my estate? But those are all things to think about. If the client's charitable, then it may be possible to have some asset, I mean, some value go to charity. Uh, certainly life insurance could be purchased to uh, deal with the risk of early death. Okay, so uh, I'm back to my PowerPoint here on page 21. Let me do another uh, quick polling question. Why do financial advisors like GRATs? A, it gives them a reason to use the word annuity in casual conversations. 
B, a two-year rolling grant keeps growth over the 75-20 rate out of an estate and allows the financial advisor to provide annual hands-on assistance. What does that mean? Well, a lot of wealthy people put all of their what net worth into two-year grants. They get a big payment at the end of year one. They put that into a new two-year grant. And all of their investments are kept under two-year grats, so everything over the 75-20 rate is being locked away to avoid estate tax. So that's the rolling grat. It has nothing to do with Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Band, although the rolling grat came after Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder Band, so you can never be absolutely sure. C, it reminds the financial advisors of cats because cats and grats rhyme. D, a zeroed out grat uses no or very little gift tax exemption. And the best answer is E, all of the above. Okay. Now, the main advantage of the grat is that under section 70 under section 2702 it specifically provides that basically there will be no gift if you undervalue the assets going into the grat you know as i said before if i put 950,000 in a grat that pays me 100,000 a year and the irs comes in and says hey it wasn't worth 950 it was worth 130% of 950 well, I don't owe a gift tax on the difference. Instead, I have to take payments proportionately larger. So when we have a client come to us with a $50 million situation, we'll most commonly do an installment sale. And we'll talk about why in a few minutes. But if the client comes to us with a $600 million situation, because of the risk of gift tax, if we undervalue the assets, we will commonly use grats instead of installment sales. And notice I said grats, plural, because I'm not sure how long the client's gonna live. Maybe I should do a four-year grat, a six-year grat, an eight-year grat, and a 10-year grat to hedge the bets if the client doesn't want to buy life insurance to hedge the bets. Well. Somebody took this adjustment feature of the GRAT way too far, and it resulted in IRS Chief Counsel Memorandum 20215018, and the taxpayer just dramatically undervalued the stock of the company he put in the GRAT. He knew it was terribly, terribly undervalued. And the IRS basically said, you had no intention of making a payment based on a percentage of value because you were so aggressive. We consider your entire grat to be disqualified. So his grat could not go back to school. It could not participate in intramural sports. It had to wear a red star on its forehead. It was a really bad thing. So as they say, pigs get fatter and hogs get slaughtered. All right, again, when I set up a graph, because it's a trust that I establish that pays benefits to me, it's disregarded for income tax purposes and its income is taxed on my return. That old saying, many happy returns, that's because I'm not making a gift each time I pay the tax for the GRAT, so my estate gets smaller, the GRAT gets bigger. Next, the GST tax issue. The tax law clearly says that if you set up a GRAT, the assets in the GRAT after the GRAT term must be taxed in the next generation, or if not, the generation skipping tax will apply. So if I put $10 million in a grad at the end of 14 years, there's a $7 million that's going to benefit my daughter for her lifetime. On my daughter's death, 
unless she has certain powers over that trust, the federal generation skipping tax can be imposed. Alternatively, I can draft the trust so on my daughter's death, the grad assets are considered to be owned by her so that there's no generation skipping tax, but there could be an estate tax if she is over the estate tax exemption. So drafting grads can be complicated. You've got the marital deduction issue, you've got generation skipping tax issues, you've got compliance with section 2702. So you have to be very careful when you draft the grad. And I'm gonna show you some sample grat provisions in a few minutes if you just stay awake. Please stay with me, wake up, wake up. Okay, so lots of fun rules relating to the grat. The next rule, top of page 28, you fund it completely on its inception. You can't say I'll put the stock in today and I'll put the limited partnership in tomorrow. It has to be simul. Spontaneous. So we have language that says if I accidentally put two different things in on two different days, then this will really be two different grats, not one grat. Secondly, the grat cannot issue a promissory note to the grantor. It has to make the payment, the annual payment, but the payment can be 105 days late. So we do have clients who make their payments 104 days late to stretch out the period of time that these growing assets are in the grat. But when it's time to pay, you have to pay. And if you don't have cash, you have to pay with something else. If you need to borrow, then the grat would borrow from a bank, but the, bank, the, bank, the grat cannot borrow from the grantor. Third, you cannot have a commutation provision. The grat, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a 10-year grat. Suddenly I get sick. I have a seven year life expectancy. I go to the remainder interest holder and I say, hey, would you mind if I just get my 10 payments a little early? I'll give you a discount and you'll get your remainder payment early. Can't do it. Just like the word commutation means you're stuck in prison for the 10 years. But what I can do, as I alluded to before, which has nothing to do with quaaludes, is I could buy the remainder interest. I could say, hey, you only owe me three other payments of 300,000 each. You've got $8 million in the grat. How about if I buy the remainder interest for 7 million six? And then when I die, I'll get the, the remainder interest. You'll have the 7 million six that I give you today. So I write a check for 7 million six to the remainder holder. And now when I die, the 7 million six is out of my estate. This is why we prepare two separate grats. One is the grat, the second is the trust that owns the remainder interest. That trust is disregarded for income tax purposes so that when I buy it, in my example, there's no income tax imposed. The last thing I'll mention on this page is the amount of the annuity payment can go up each year by as much as 20%. But it also can come down eventually. So I'll give you two examples of when it would come down. And I don't mean depress. I mean the payment comes down. The first example is I put the stock of a company in a grat. The company's going to sell. I want the first five million. Everything over that I really want to go to my children. We value the company at six million. I put the company in the grat. And the grat says, I get 5 million in a year, and then I get 100,000 a year for nine years. Well, the company sells for 10 million. I get the first 5 million, and then I still take my 100,000 a year. But if the IRS comes in and says, wait a minute, it was worth 10 million when you put it in, then I get my first payment of 5 million, and then my other payments will be maybe 200,000 a year to, to make up for that. So that would be the first example of a grat with reducing payments. The second example is the IRS says you have to do a two year grat. They don't want you to do a one year grat. So if you're gonna do a two year grat, 
maybe you would say that I'll get 90% of my payments in year one and 10% in year two. So I put a million in at the end of year one, I get 900,000 back, which I put in another grad immediately. Year number two, I get 100,000. So it's mostly a one year grad, but technically it is a two year grad. Okay, here are some examples of grats that I think are worth looking at. The first example, which we rarely see because planners don't think about it, is the what I call the lifetime bypass grat. So in this example, I put $4 million into the lifetime bypass grat. It pays me back $1,975,000 at the end of year one, and 20% more than that, $2,272,000 at the end of year two. What's left in the grat is held for my wife, Marcia. She gets what she needs for health education, maintenance, and support, and she can direct where the trust assets go when she dies. Can she direct them to me? Well, if we don't have a previous understanding to that effect, it is conceivable that she could direct those assets to a trust that might benefit me. But more important for us, she can live off the trust if we have an economic setback. And if we need to disinherit certain relatives or take care of other relatives, she can direct that. So that is the lifetime bypass grad. Here's another example of the math. The math can be staggering. Here you have a company that makes $5 million a year and the client has 10% of the company. That is paying the client, I'm sorry, the client makes 300, 3 million a year. The company makes 3 million a year. The client has 10%, which is accounting for 300,000 a year. The company is valued at 15 million. 10% of the company is valued at 66% of 3 million. So about 2 million. The GRAT payments are gonna be 119,635 a year. So what's gonna happen is the client's gonna get, the GRAT is gonna receive 300,000 a year in dividends, make the annuity payment of 119,000. After 10 years, the GRAT has 2 million five, plus it owns the company. It owns 10% of the company. And there was no, gift tax exemption used when the GRAT was set up. Okay, let's go back to the polling questions. Why use a GRAT remainder trust? A, it allows for the income tax-free purchase of the remainder interest. If the grantor, grantor wants out of the arrangement, B, if the grantor dies during the grant term, the grant assets will be subject to a state tax. That's not a great reason, but let's believe it. Let's, let's pretend it is. C, the remainder of trust can allow trust protectors to change the dispositive provisions without having them be able to change the grant. And D, E, all of the above. Well, this is a messed up question. So it's either you can answer A or B. No, I'm sorry, you can answer A or C, but sometimes Y. Josh, let us know when everybody's done with this. You've heard of defective trusts? Well, this is a defective polling question. All right. By the way, this is a good crowd. You guys are very quick. Oh, speaking of quick. See, you're very quick. I hope you saw that. Next, just again, how you might show a GRAT or a CLAT to a client. Just a simple spreadsheet. You put a million in, you have an annual payment. Here's what's left at the end. Or if you use a discount, 
you actually have more in there. Here's what's left at the end. It does not have to be complicated. Here's a typical scenario. These clients had a very uh, valuable business and they put 40% of the business in the graph. And in addition to that, they put 40% of the intellectual property company in the graph because there was a licensee fee, fee being paid. So we wanted to make sure everything was at arm's length. We don't want the IRS to say, well, you should have paid more licensing, less licensing. So we put them both in the graph. So that, that's where a graph may fit in your situation. And now here's a, here's a very nice thing, and it's the leveraged graph. So here you have a client that owns a 41% interest in a limited partnership that may be worth anywhere from 12 to 36 million. It's hard to value some of these things. So the client sets up an LLC and puts the FLP interest in there, puts 4 million in there in cash, and takes back a $10 million promissory note at the applicable federal rate. Now remember the 7520 rate is higher than the than the long-term applicable federal rate. So this allows the client to leverage on the applicable federal rate and the LLC is worth a lot less than it would have been. So the third step is that the LLC is valued at about 10 million. It owes the taxpayer 10 million. It, it's worth about 20 million minus the 10 million note. So we're going to make four annual payments of a million six after discounts. And if the IRS audits this and doubles the value, we're going to make bigger annual payments back. But still, if you think about it, you're getting the benefit of a long term installment note. You're getting the benefit of the client paying the income tax on the income of the arrangement. And now you have the benefit of very, very low risk of gift tax. Because if the IRS comes back and says this was worth 30 million, well, then the taxpayer is owed a lot more from the grad. Everything may come out, but there was very little risk of a large tax. So if you're thinking, well, I want to do an installment sale, but I don't want the, ta the gift tax risk. Maybe I should do a GRAT. Well, give thought to this hybrid method. I learned about this from Stacy Eastland's wonderful outline called, uh, I think it's called Working with the GRAT Hat or Pulling the Rabbit Out of the GRAT Hat. I'll be glad to send you a copy of it. We, we can get the most recent edition from Stacy. He's absolutely brilliant. Uh, here's another thought where you set up a new LLC to own other things you own, and maybe you would receive multiple level discounts if the lower tier entities are minority interests, which you've had with other people or family members for a number of years. And then, as, as I said before, you can structure in a note. So the GRAT payments are very small unless the IRS comes in and, and increases the value significantly, and then the GRAT payments would be larger. The issue from a, from a estate tax planning standpoint becomes that you're moving a lot of assets to a GRAT that may not be GST exempt. Now, what if you have a client who has a short life expectancy or a high risk of dying during their life expectancy, and you'd like to use what's called a self-canceling installment note, but you have concern because of the IRS's position in the Davidson case, that if your client is not of good health and enters into a self-canceling installment note, there may be a large gift on inception. Well, there's a good chance that somebody in not good health can enter into a self-canceling installment note because it's basically the same thing as a, as a private annuity and the private annuity treasury re regulation tables only say the person has to have better than a 50% chance of surviving any disease they may have. So what can we do here? Well, the client opens an LLC and puts the assets in the LLC. In this situation, the assets are estimated to be worth 2 million. 
The client takes back a million five self-canceling installment note. It will cancel on death. The IRS may say that this note is only worth 100,000 because the client only has a two-year life expectancy. But we believe that under the Treasury regulations, you can use a million five. Well, what's the LLC worth? Well, if the IRS is right, the LLC is worth a million eight. If I'm right, then the LLC is worth 500,000. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer the LLC interest to the GRAT in exchange for four to 500,000 of payments. Very, very little gift if no, or no gift at all. If this is not challenged, then the client dies. The skin is forgiven. The grad has the LLC. Two million plus growth is out of the estate. If the IRS comes up and says, wait a minute, the self-canceling installment note was a huge gift. No, it wasn't. The self-canceling installment note was not a gift. The transfer of the LLC to the GRAT was a gift. Larger payments are owed back. So we have used this technique on a number of occasions when the client comes and says, I've got bad health news. I know I can live at least two or three years. What can you do for me? Well, let's try the scrat. You, if you get better and the IRS audits it, you're not, you should not owe gift tax return. Uh, but if you die during the term, you may avoid estate tax on all of these assets. So to compare the GRAT to the installment sale to the Graner, uh, to Graner Trust to an annuity sale to a Graner Trust, with the GRAT, you have much lower gift tax risk because the IRS will make you take larger payments and not be as well equipped to make you pay a gift tax. With an installment sale to Grantor Trust, if I put $10 million in an LLC and transfer it and sell it to a trust for an 8 million note or a 7 million note, I could use an adjustment clause called a WANDRY, W-A-N-D-R-Y clause, to help ameliorate the risk, but the IRS does not like WANDRY clauses and there's not a full tax court opinion or any court of appeals opinion that likes a wandry clause, unless you make it very fancy and complicated and have the overflow go to, to uh, taxes. Now that's not Texas, that's taxes, even if you're in Dallas. And then the risk to the annuity sale to the Granter Trust, same thing on the gift issue. The annuity sale to the Granter Trust is, I put a bunch of assets in the Granter Trust, and then I sell other assets for the right to receive a payment that ends on my death. I use standard mortality tables. And as the result of that, a lot of estate tax is avoided. Now, with a grad, if I die during the grad term, it can be a terrible result. If I die during the installment sale term, it's not so bad. Then with the GRAT, it might be GST exempt if you use some uh, techniques that are in Stacy's outline, but maybe not. The installment sale to the Grant or Trust will be GST exempt, as will the annuity sale. Um, the GRAT, we often use a two-year GRAT to avoid the risk of death. With an installment sale, uh, you can go long-term with an annuity sale, you can go for life. Then finally, if you do an annuity sale, you have to have a certain amount in the trust, and it's a, it's a lot that you have to have in that trust, an amount sufficient so that the trust could satisfy all payments if it earns money only at the 75-20 rate, and the person lives until age 110. Heavens to Betsy. That doesn't happen very often that somebody lives to 110. So that regulation may be invalid, but it is out there. So I have other more um, in-depth comparison charts that, that are in the materials that you can look at. Um, scoring these things from one to 10. Look at all three. If you have a situation that is very large and you don't want to risk, 
of the gift tax. If the situation is smaller, then more commonly you'll use the installment sale or maybe the leveraged GRAT as a hybrid. Here's an, another uh, mathematical example on, well, actually, where was that? Well, before I do that, here's the slide I was on. You know, typically, if the clients are in the 30 to 50 million range, we'll just do installment sales only. Each spouse sets up an irrevocable trust, they make a seed capital gift, and they transfer their S Corp stock to each trust in exchange for a note. But if it's a very large situation, we may just have one client do an irrevocable trust and the other client does a grat for a higher percentage of the um, assets. So with 11, with nine minutes left, let me go back to the uh, software. and see if the forms are working. So, oh, I go to calculator, GRAT, general explanation, and now I wanna see sample provisions for a GRAT. Okay, I click on GRAT sample provisions, and here are some sample GRAT provisions that you can look at. By the way, have I done the last polling question? All right, let me do the last polling question. I know some of you are in states where you can leave after 50 minutes and you want to get the last polling question done. You're not here because you love me. You're here because you need me. Okay, where is the last? Did I accidentally close the PowerPoint? Hmm. What do I, there it is. Sorry, everyone, we're having technical difficulties also known as Alan is clumsy. So go to from the beginning. Here is the last polling question. Congratulations, you made it. Would you like to pre-register for all of our upcoming Saturday webinars? Now we will respell Saturday the next time you see this on a Saturday. A, yes, I love the series and want to see more. B, yes, but only if there are more puppets. C, yes, but please have less cheesy polling questions. Or D, no thanks, I would rather climb a tree today. Well, that's as bad as it gets or as good as it gets, I guess. Can I go back now? Yep. All right. So, here are some sample provisions for the grant or retained annuity trust. Don't try this at home. Some of these provisions may not work, but what you can see here is you put into the trust the number of years and what the percentages are based upon the 75-20 rate for the day that the trust is set up with a savings clause that if you've used the wrong rate, it automatically corrects to the right rate. Secondly, you say that if for some reason I put more in that's taxable than my estate tax exemption, then the, the excess goes to the marital deduction. Secondly, if I die during the annuity term, this thing turns into a Q-tip marital deduction trust to the extent necessary to avoid federal estate tax. Okay, then this trust doesn't apply until it is completely funded with all of the assets of under Exhibit A. Until Exhibit B is signed, none of the assets in Exhibit A will be considered to be in this trust, and this trust will be considered to be a revocable trust until everybody has finished Exhibit A and Exhibit B. And then after that, after the trust is established, if more contributions are made, they become a separate grant or retained annuity trust so that we have a grant or retained annuity trust. 405, the trustee can amend the trust to the extent necessary to comply with the GRAT rules. 
Article 5, after the grant term, everything goes to the remainder trust unless the remainder interest has been sold back to the grantor, in which case everything goes back to the grantor at that time. Let me mention that some planners are writing about, and some are probably doing 99-year grants, where a relatively young person enters into a 99-year grant, and then if the interest rates change dramatically, suddenly he or she might be able to buy that remainder interest for millions of dollars, be done with the grant, and have millions of dollars placed into a remainder interest. That's if interest rates go down. It's an interesting concept and maybe a good way to get creditor protection. Okay, Article 6, I've shown you a lot of handy dandy trusteeship language. I've got some example trust protector provisions. I've got a scrivener protector provision, which would allow our law firm to fix something that's broken if we find out that it's broken. And then I've got a grant or trust provision, which allows the trust to be disregarded for income tax purposes after the GRAT term. Then I've got Exhibit A, which tells what's going into the GRAT, and Exhibit B, which says when it's been funded. So that is the sample GRAT. Then I've got the sample remainder trust, which discusses that it's receiving $10 plus the remainder interest. The trustee is able to sell the remainder interest and after the death of the grantor, the trust continues as a bypass trust for the surviving spouse, and then is held for the lifetime of descendants. So those are some sample documents. We don't, don't use our documents, use somebody else's, but at least that may give you some clauses that you would like to uh, consider. So going back now for questions, and by the way, I did not show everything on a state view. I think I'm at the end here in three minutes, I'll go ahead and show you the rest of the estate view features of the GRAT, but everybody can leave if you needed 60 minutes. Um, you almost got it. All right. Um, are there Powell concerns in connection with the LLC? Yes. We would have done a better job if we showed one tenth of a percent of that LLC owned by a special trust with a special unrelated trustee who would have to approve any distributions or liquidations from that trust. Thank you, Stuart. That's a very good point. Okay, from David. In the LLC example of 1% voting, 99% non voting, is the LLC a partnership for income tax purposes? It may be, or it may be taxed as an S Corp. A GRAT could own S Corp stock if it makes an ESBT election. Okay, uh, David has a client that transferred an LLC interest to a GRAT, not enough rental income to pay the annuity annually. The grantor's making loans to the LLC and then distributing the annuity payment. No, no, you can't do that. No, no. That's the same thing as being owed money. What the grantor could do would be to take back partial ownership interests in the real estate entity or somehow allow the real estate entity to borrow from someone other than the uh, grantor. Okay, what was that quick chocolate? Well, when somebody in my office says they need something quick, I just hand them this. It's, it's Nestle's Nesquik chocolate and it's America's number one chocolate powder. And they did not pay me to say this. You asked. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, Miguel, Alan could have a second career telling dad jokes. Thanks very much. I think you meant bad jokes, not dad jokes. But I'll ask my dad. All right. Um, let me go back. So now we're done. Do 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 do. He's done. Stick around for part two. Okay, so now I'll just go back to the, to the Estate View software, and I want to show you some things uh, that it does in the GRAT module. Uh, the first thing is 
when I go to general explanation, I can also click on general explanation and I can click on planners check checklist. I can hit submit and then the checklist comes up, which gives me a checklist of different things to consider relating to the GRAT. And then the other thing that I showed you, the uh, general explanation comes up there, which is a good client explanation and a pretty good reminder for you of primary GRAT terms. All right, so that's that. Then uh, on the calculator, when I go to advanced, you saw how the discount works. I can also put non-discounted assets in, like say I put a million in cash in. But here's a nice button, the annual additional income. So let's say here that I have a, uh, a $5 million company. I'm going to give away 99% uh, of a $5 million company. And it not only is it worth $5 million and it's growing at 7% a year, but it's shooting off dividends of $500,000 a year, or for, let's say $400,000 a year. This is not at all unusual, as you know, in your own practice. Uh, I'm going to show that the grantor pays all the income taxes. I'm going to show that. In this case, 5% of the value of the trust is the income taxes because of the, I mean, 4% of the value of the trust is paid in income taxes. And I'm going to let this 60 year old live to year 80. And let's look at this. So if I have a level payment grant based upon $5 million and uh, the annuity payment's going to have to be 647 a year, but I said that it's only uh, spitting out three, 400,000 of income. So I need to get the annuity amount down to 400,000. Well, I could take a, more, a larger discount. Right now I'm taking a 20% discount. I could take a 25% discount. That gets the annuity down to 615,000. I could expand the term by a couple of years. And when I click on the term, I see that I would need to have a 19 year term to get the annuity payment down to the 400,000. Well, the client doesn't want to do that. Let's go down, let's go back to 12 years, but let's go ahead and do a term that increases by 20% a year. So now the annuity amount is doesn't hit 400,000 until year five. And by then the trust will have accumulated a lot of cash from the additional income in order to be able to pay all of the annuity payments. So it looks to me like 12 years will work. There's my estate tax savings if the client dies in year at, after year 12 from the value of the company and the dividends. There's my estate tax savings from the client paying the income tax. So my total estate tax savings pay here is 6.4 million. The client put a very valuable property and a million dollars cash into this grant had zero gift and at the end of the day only got back four million dollars where the grant has after 20 years the grant has 14 million uh no i'm sorry the grant has 36 million in it after 14 years after after 20 years some other features of the software is I may not want to show this many columns or that many columns. So if I want to show more or less detail, I click on after summary columns and I can just click on the columns I want to show. So now you see more columns across the top. I can do the same thing across the bottom. I could take out some of the columns. Now, you know, you're you may have too many columns. Let's say that he's going to live to 90. 
I want to show more. They, they're looking small. Well, I can just show every other column by clicking there and then hit full fit again. And now I'm showing every other column. Well, then you would like to play some games with these numbers. You'd like to show the client their personal spending. You'd like to show state taxes, which we don't show specifically. So you click export to Excel. And now I have an Excel spreadsheet that is specifically built from what you just saw. So that, where did it go? All right, so that's another feature. Another feature, the uh, timelines and chart. Oh, you may want to have a gift. So a lot of planners believe that you should have at least a 1% gift because the IRS has approved a 1% gift. So if I want to have a 1% gift, I just click here to 1%. And now I'm showing the 1% gift, a gift of $47,500. And the payments can be a little bit less. I also have two timelines and uh, charts here. I click there. I have a stacked area chart. This shows me in green the growth in value each year. And in beige, I believe that's beige, the value of the grat. And now when I change my a number, this changes, which is cool. Uh, this shows me the probability of surviving to each particular year. And this shows me the value of the trust over time. Now, if I do two grats, I'll just hit duplicate and I'll change 7% rate of return to 8%. I'll change 12 years to 11 years. And now it's comparing those two grats. So it, it compares them, uh, compares them in the total value over time chart. And let me see if I missed anything. Um, you've got a general explanation. You will have a short explanation, a planner's checklist, PowerPoint presentation, and the sample provisions for each uh, under each of these. Let me see if there's any questions on the so on the GRAT software. Will the archive include the extra time past the hour mark? Yes, it will. Thank you very much. Why is gift value allowed to go negative? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, we'll have Kevin change it. So it stays at zero. All right. Let me just mention that the Cupert calculator, the skin calculator, the CLAT calculator, the private annuity calculator, the CRAT calculator, they all look pretty much the same. So once you learn one of these, you can do all of them. Uh, we're, look, we're working on the charitable remainder unit trust calculator right now. So now I want to just show you the main module. So I will um, go to the main module. Now we call this the main module because it was invented in Kenny Buckport, Maine, while holding on to a horse by its mane. All right, so you have your inputs. On th this, by the way, this calculator is completely independent of the other calculators. This calculator is intended to allow your client to see a step-by-step -step progression of the estate tax strategies that we commonly employ, and it allows you to run the numbers to see how these things work. So at the beginning, you can put the client's name or the planner's name. You can put the client's name. You can put their date of birth or their age. We can show when they're going to die. We could start at 10 years. Let me know if you think the skull and crossbones is a little bit unrespectful. Uh, when you hover over each choice, you get uh, a prompt of what these things are. So the big picture, if you look in the middle, is you have Bob and Mary, and they have a $3 million house, 30 million of investments growing at about 6% a year, and a $600,000 life insurance policy. And Bob's gonna live 10 years, so Mary's gonna live 20 years. 
So after the 10th year, the house is going to be worth 4 million, investments 46 million. And when Mary dies, the total shooting match, 81 million. Yes, you saw that, 81 million. Estate tax, 32 million. Now, some of the inputs that affect this, we can say while Bob is living and until his uh, till his 75th birthday, they're going to be adding 300,000 a year to their savings because he still works. But then after that, they'll be spending 300 a year from their savings. Okay. And then we can show that after Bob's death, Mary will be spending 300,000 a year. So that's going to help deplete the estate and that's an honest thing you can ask your clients, what are you going to spend? You can't you can't ignore that. So then we can decide whether portability is going to apply. We'll be optimistic and say that portability will apply. If portability doesn't apply, and when I click the box, you see that estate tax goes from 18 million to 22 million. So you hope that if one spouse dies, the other will get what's remaining of the estate tax exemption of the first dying spouse. Then will the estate tax exemption go down by half in 2026? Uh, we assume it will if you check the box. If I uncheck the box, then the estate tax goes way down. Um, we can uncheck the box just for demonstration purposes here and assume that they have more in assets. Let's say they have uh, 50 million in assets. Okay, then on the houses, if there's no Cupert, if there's no qualified personal residence trust, then we just say 3 million rate of increase in, in value, let's say maybe 4% a year because inflation's back. And then I have investments at 50 million. Will there be a bypass trust in the maximum amount on the first death? Yes. And now let's see where we are. So if they do no estate planning, they both die this year. I click here, 11 million of estate tax. If they no, do no planning and go for 30 years, 31 million of estate tax. But if on the first death, we fund a credit shelter trust, click credit shelter trust, you see that's funded with 18 million on the first death and the estate tax will be 23 million instead of what it would have been, which so it goes down from 31 million to 23 million. All right, and now we could do annual gifting. They have two children, and in 10 years, they expect to have four grandchildren. So if they do annual gifting of 17,000 a year per child and grandchild, and this will go up with the consumer price index. Then we click on gifting and we see a gift trust with $10 million in it after 30 years. Or if we could gift at a 25% discount, then the estate tax will go down to 19 million. The gifting trust will have 14 million in it. So that's the, the gifting module. And now I will show you the uh, Cupert module. So right now we're not using a Cupert. So you go to Cupert and it's pretty much the same. But if you want to use a Cupert, and by the way, Cupert, the next time you see this will be moved up to right after the bypass trust. If you want to do a Cupert, then I would first go to our Cupert calculator, find out what kind of Cupert you're doing as far as term and percentages and then come back to here. But if you want to shortcut it to here, I go to the personal residence, number of Cuperts, I go from zero to one. There's my first Cupert. And then this is for Bob, the first person, 75-20 rate, 5%. If I go with a eight-year Cupert, then he's made a gift of 16 million 
I mean, of a million six twenty four. And if he pays rent at eight percent of the value of the cupid after the eight year term, then the uh, cupid residence is disappeared. The residence gone into the cupid, and then the cupid is shown over here. The three million home is worth nine million. Nine million after thirty years, the rent paid was worth a million four fifty four. And the estate tax is down to six million seven thirty eight. That's down from twenty million. So that that cupid that doesn't seem accurate. We'll have to double check it. If you're going to do a separate second cupid, then here click this to two cupids, and then pick a term for the second cupid. And by the way, if you go beyond the life expectancy of the client, you'll see the cupid fails. So when you play with the client's life expectancy, like if I decide I want to let him live longer than uh, 10 years, then I can move the uh, projected date of death up and then the cupid will unfail. It'll no longer, it has no longer uh, been in failure, so to speak. So let me go back to cupid here. Cupert two, now if they're gonna do two Cuperts, you could assume that half the house is going into each Cupert, so it gives you a 15% discount. If you wanna take a higher discount, you can, but it can be somewhat risky. So that, that covers Cuperts. Now we do have life insurance as well. If you want to remove a policy, click there, policy goes away. If you want to add a policy, then you would add in the information on the policy and whether it's in an eyelid or not. And then you can add the same information, which will be duplicated, and put it in an eyelid. So this will show you the before and after the life insurance trust. So held in an eyelid, no. Uh, death or permanent, we'll say permanent. Number of years for. Uh, Premium, we'll say they have 12 years less left at eight uh, at eight thousand a year, and then we'll say the uh, death benefit is going to be five hundred thousand for the whole time. It's not in an islet. Okay, then I will. Uh, copy this policy to post planning. So I have the same exact numbers, but it, now it's held in an islet post planning. And maybe they'll pay a little bit more premium in post planning and get a little bit more death benefit. So now when I click on life insurance, when I, when I click before life insurance, it's showing me what the life insurance is before the change. And now when I click on life insurance, it shows me the life insurance after the change. When it's in yellow, it's taxable. When it's in purple, it's not taxable. And the life insurance, when you when you use it, it reduces the gifting trust because what you were using to put into the gifting trust is satisfying those life insurance premiums. You can have an unlimited number of life insurance policies for each spouse and for second to die. Then we have the installment sale to an irrevocable trust. So let's say that the client wants to put 14750 into an LLC, use a 25% discount. We'll need to make a, a that'll be a $9,625,000 value that the 99% non-voting member LLC can be sold for. They want to make a $962,500 seed capital gift. I love the fact that when you increase one, all those other numbers change in uniform. Okay, let's assume a, the long-term applicable federal rate is 4%. It's a conventional note, not self-canceling. It's a 20-year note. And you, the company you're selling also has 200,000 of income that it pays out every year um, for the next 30 years, because it's an S corporation. So now I click on installment sale and 
the beautiful thing is when you click on installment sale, that estate tax goes down significantly. And then I can just say, well, how much more do I need to sell to get the estate tax down lower? I could just click here and you see the estate tax coming down, what goes to beneficiaries coming up. And then finally, the last module, maybe my favorite is the charity module. And if I say, well, what do I need to leave to charity to have no estate tax? Click on testamentary charity. And it says, well, if you would leave charity, a million four forty, you would have no estate tax as compared to if you do everything else. I can make this a little bit more dramatic or traumatic, depending upon how you want to look at it, by um, eliminating the cuperts. So now, without the cuperts, my estate tax is ten million before charity. With charity. 25 million would have to go to the charity to avoid the estate tax. So the children, instead of getting a million, I mean 134,000 with Uncle Sam getting 10, they get 119,000 with Uncle Sam getting 25. So you can consider that. You can show the client the numbers. But then remember, you could do a charitable lead annuity trust, which generates that same charitable tax deduction makes annual payments to a charity, but what's left goes to the children. You can go to our CLAT module, and then after you go to our CLAT module, you might decide to hit the CLAT button here. And when I hit CLAT button, it asks me what percentage at the in the end of the game, if I'm leaving 25 million to the CLAT, what percentage is actually gonna go to charity? What percentage is actually gonna go to the descendants? based on present values. And let's say that 70% will go to the charity, 30% to the descendants after the payment term. As you know, it's not predictable, but maybe that's a good estimate. So now the charity is getting 17 million and my children are getting 119 million plus about another 7 million six in present value dollars for a total of 126 million. Not a bad day. A um, couple of other features, if you want to find the bypass trust, just click there and there, there's your input. If you want to find the insurance, just click there, there's your input. Okay, I've shown you the logistical view. There's also a timeline view. This shows you each trust and how they grow as time goes on. And there will be red, see the charity or the charitable remainder trust there at the top. But if I don't do charity, I click off charity, the red is the estate tax. If I want the client to die, the first dying spouse to, to die sooner, then I can move this back and forth to see what the result is. And then if I wanna know what the estate tax is for any year after the first death, it just shows me, I just look, here's 2035, there's the estate tax. So um, that, that's the timeline. Then if you want to know what the annual amounts are for any particular feature of this, like how did I decide or how did we figure out what's in the trust? This shows you the installment sale trust, everything going in, everything coming out, and what's there at the end so that it is uh, you know, all based on math here. And this is not math that we invented. It's just real math. All right, now once I decide that I wanna show this to my client, I click generate client letter. And then if I wanna show the client all the scenarios, if I wanna have an introduction that shows uh, what the basic planning is for estate tax, I click generate client letter. And now the letter is being written as a Word document. You can see that down there. By the way, th this does work on Apple uh, computers, it does work on um, iPads, it does work on your phone, although it's really hard to use on your phone, but you could do the inputs on your phone. It's a good reason to have a uh, larger phone. We hope to be out by January on this. There's still a lot of things we're doing with it, but until then, you can beta test it. So here is my explanation letter. And the 
explanation letter, which Josh, we want to send to everybody. Um, I don't know what this trial version of Sync Fusion Word Library is, but I guess we've added something there. And uh, there's your explanation. There's all your inputs. So you can remember what you put in there. You can also save your inputs to your computer. And then there's the explanation of what happens if there's no planning in the tax, what happens with bypass trust, what happens with annual gifting, et cetera, et cetera, all the way uh, down to the CLAT. Oh, the CLAT. There's the CLAT right there. Isn't it pretty? Okay, let me see if there's any questions and then we will call it a day. Um, How many hours is this session really going to take? Well, I know it seemed a lot longer. Sorry about that. Um, how much is the software? Haven't decided yet. We're open to your suggestions. Okay, why, when would you toggle off grant or trust status? Well, you would toggle off grant or trust status when the client says, wait a minute, I don't want to pay the taxes for this trust anymore. My net worth is lower than I want it to be. And then you're able to toggle off grant or trust status. Uh, and you, while my friend Professor Hesh says you have to be careful because the burn of the income tax could eat up your whole estate, because you could divide a trust into two or three trusts, toggle off grant or trust status on some of them, keep them on others, I'm not that concerned. People just have to be uh, careful. So that concludes. Uh, this presentation. I want to thank uh, Jill Ashley, who's been helping me a lot with the software. She's really good at finding mistakes, and I'm really good at making mistakes. And then I want to thank Kevin Gray, who is an amazing, amazing programmer and has done a great job taking this software from where it was to where it is today. We welcome your questions, comments, and suggestions. My email address is agassman, A-G-A-S-S-M-A-N, at G-A-S-S-M-A-N-P-A dot com. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and hopefully you'll be able to use some or a great deal of this information to help yourself and others. Thanks again.